Good afternoon, and thank you for attending this month's Ocean Grand Rounds. Today, we are excited to host Dr. John Heinzman and Dr. Erica Cottrell of Ocean and Oregon Health and Science University as they present on eChange, evaluating community health centers adoption of a new global capitation payment. Dr. John Heinzman is a family physician at OHSU and the lead clinical scientist at Ocean. Dr. Heinzman's research interests focus on primary care access among Latino populations, especially those using community health centers. Dr. Heinzman uses electronic health records to better understand inequalities in care. This includes studying differences in asthma treatment delivered in primary care between non-Hispanic white children and Latino children. It also includes evaluating alternative ways to pay for primary care in community health centers. Dr. Heinzman is part of a team committed to using new methods to better understand nuanced health disparities in racial and ethnic minorities and to give providers and policymakers better data to improve the health of all. Dr. Erica Cottrell holds a joint appointment as an investigator at Ocean and an assistant professor at OHSU Department of Family Medicine. At Ocean, she is involved in research projects focused on understanding the impact of community and individual level social determinants of health on healthcare outcomes, developing and testing EHR based tools for identifying and addressing social determinants of health in community health centers, and evaluating the impact of payment reform and policy changes on reproductive healthcare utilization in safety net settings. At OHSU, she serves as the director of the Health Experiences Research Corps for the Oregon Clinical and Translational Research Institute. She earned her PhD in sociology from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and her master's in public policy from Harvard University. This session is being recorded. Attendees are muted upon entry, but if you are not, please mute your microphone and pose your questions through the chat box. This presentation will last approximately 45 minutes with 10 to 15 minutes at the end to answer any questions you may have. We will now pass the mic to Dr. John Heinzman and Dr. Erica Cottrell to present eChange, evaluating community health centers adoption of a new global capitation payment. Thanks, Will. Hi, uh, good uh, afternoon, everybody. Um, Erica, Dr. Cottrell is gonna get, the, get our slides back up here. Um, uh, again, um, my name is John Heintzman, um, and I will, uh, and Will did a very gracious introduction. And Erica, do you want to say hi? You're muted, Erica. Oh, slight audio problems there. There we go. Hi, guys. It's nice to see everyone. Um, I'm just trying to make sure that I have the share going before you start introducing and going forward, John. Oh, sure. Are Look, you, is everybody able to see the slides? It looks good. It looks good. Excellent. <clears throat> Great. So if you hit the next uh, next slide, Erica. Oh, and so I so we are going to talk today about eChange, um, which was an evaluation of Oregon's alternative payment methodology pilot. Um, I was the, uh, the the PI of that project, and Erica was the Ocean Site PI. And so that's what we're we're excited to be <clears throat> presenting to you today. So a little bit about about, about the background. And so, so in 2013, the Oregon Primary Care Association and Oregon Health uh, Authority launched the APCM pilot, and we'll talk about those initials in a minute basically trying to launch an initiative that got um, community health centers, uh, who saw a large proportion of Medicaid patients, obviously, um, away from a, a fee-for-service visit volume-based volume, volume -based model and giving them um, a capitated per member per month rates so that clinics could um, better focus uh, their kind of you know, medical home care um, towards what patients really needed and deliver services in the ways that were most effective. Um, and this started um, in, um, in 2013. Okay, next slide. There were really two, uh, there, there, there were really two uh, features or points of emphasis and, and it is, um, these, these points are demonstrated by an early name change. So when the pilot was first launched, it was the alternative payment methodology. Um, experiment and it was changed very early to APCM, the Alternative Payment and Advanced Care Model. 
uh, because the, uh, the purpose of the initiative was to um, not only change a payment structure, but, uh, but, um, but to encourage and facilitate um, the use of alternative strategies uh, for, um, for delivering quality care. Um, the kind of strategies that most folks on the call, if you're part of a health system, if you're a clinician, would be familiar to you. You know, population management, using uh, team-based care, behaviorists, um, Alter, alternative kinds of encounters. Um, so all, all of those kinds of those kinds of ways in which we could, we would care for patients. Um, and I will say we so the for, so the formal title is the is the APCM. You will see, unfortunately, sometimes on the research team we got into a bad habit of using APM. So in a couple slides, you may see APM uh, stuck stuck in there some in a few places. And so um, in 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 published figures, and so that was our error. So apologies for for any uh, inconsistency. Uh, next slide, and Erica, it's on you. All right, so I'm gonna take over and say a little bit more and then pass it back to John um, later on in the presentation. Um, so I think one of the things that uh, helps to understand APCM is that the state sort of set out some targets for the clinics who decided to take part. And I'll talk a little bit more in a second about who took part and how this, you know, the, the beginning stages of this, um, but really, they wanted to make sure that, um, you know, they looked at this sort of quadruple aim. They wanted to make sure that clinics were able to meet quality metrics and kind of they, they had them look at the same metrics that are put forward for the CCOs in Oregon. Um, they wanted to make sure that it was cost neutral. Um, they weren't looking for it to necessarily save money, but they wanted it to be cost neutral and they did not want to see a decline in access. Um, so I feel like with these access quality and costs, like, Ideally, it'd be best if these, these metrics improved, but for the first pilot phase, they really wanted to see, could they stay the same? Could this be a, could they have this shift in care and payment and that there wouldn't be a negative impact on access quality and cost? And then I think I wanted to also point out that fourth quadrant in the bottom right on population health equity. Um, and there was a huge focus on this with the APCM clinic. So it, such that this change in payment may enable them to focus a bit more on the, the biocycle social needs of their population on social determinants of health and really thinking about creative ways to improve the health of their population. So I will go on to the next slide. So we um, had a really unique opportunity to study some of the real-time changes that were happening as a result of APCM in Oregon. And I think really um, Jen DeVoe and Deb Cohen were, were the first ones to really um, make some relationships with um, the Oregon Primary Care Association and, and really think about how we could how we could be poised to study the changes that were happening right here in Oregon and how um, we could both we could use mixed methods, um, both qualitative data collection and looking at our, our OCHA and EHR network data to really understand what was going on in this in this pretty unique uh, natural experiment. So today we're going to tell you about two studies that sort of were, were very interrelated and were really seen as a sort of sequential steps in this exploration. And, and, and really the overall goal of both is to study real-time changes happening in Oregon CHCs as a result of APM, to really get in there and see how this policy experiment was unfolding. So the first one um, was uh, funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and this was back in 2013, 2015. So APM, APCM was first launched in March of 2013, and, and, and this funding started soon after that. Um, and it was a really excellent way um, to get into those phase, the first phase of APCM clinics and understand what was going on qualitatively. So I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and then uh, there was an ARC R01 that was funded um, um, through the efforts of many, many people, including um, Jen DeVoe and Heather Angier um, and, and John Heinzman, who, who is, took over as the PI, to really use EHR, EHR data to, to look a little bit further and how this was impacting outcomes in clinics, um, really looking at pre-post changes in CHC services and uh, comparing APN clinics to match control. So we'll tell you about both of these studies today. Um, first, I'm going to start a little bit with the mixed methods evaluation that we did starting in 2013. Um, I'll acknowledge all the folks, or we will acknowledge all the folks who contributed um, at the end of the part, end of this 
end of this presentation, but I just wanted to sprinkle this in throughout because there were so many people as I was reflecting on this and we were putting together this presentation is just realizing how many people have contributed to this. Um, starting back with this original qualitative study. And I wanted to specifically call out um, Sonia Likamahua Ackman, um, Jill Arkind, um, who really were on the ground doing some of these, these amazing interviews that happened now way back in 2013, 2014. So the goal of this study, again, was to really look at the real-time changes happening in clinics as a result of the APCM impl implementation. And it was really looking right at the beginning when they were first starting. Um, there were three CHCs that were in the first phase of implementation. Uh, and Sonia and Jill and also Jen Hall also did a lot of this work, went to all of these clinics and, and did some interviews, um, site observations, and, and really some pretty in-depth qualitative data collection. We also, in this first phase, all of the APM CHCs were required to take part in a learning collaborative that was hosted by the Oregon Primary Care Association. And these happen quarterly. And this is where people would really focus on the care piece of APM to help clinics think through how they how this, this payment methodology might, might enable them to change care. So we also were embedded within these um, learning collaboratives as, as sort of observers and listeners. Uh, a key focus of this early work um, funded by RWJ was to do some immediate dissemination. And those of you familiar with research know that this isn't always the way we do it, um, but RWJ really wanted this. They wanted us to start a blog. Um, so we did. <laughs> we uh, had um, a blog that went on for a couple of years. Um, it's, it's archived within our Ocean site if you want to go back and look at it. I think there's some really cool information in there. For a couple of the blog posts, we partnered with the Health Affairs blog, um, and they actually posted, posted our, our short write-ups. And um, this one in particular got a lot of traction, and it just really talked about the origins of this in Oregon, where we um, worked with some folks from Oregon Primary Care Association, Craig Hostetler and Laura Sisolak in, in particular, to really get at the story of how this came about. And so um, I think that was a really key feature of this, of this of this project was getting this blog out and written and partnering with different people to, to write posts on what was happening in our state. I think I'll, I'll bring up two from, I just wanna bring up a few key things from these early learnings and from like sort of the origins of this and where it came from. Um, in some of these interviews, one, I think this one's particularly instructive. I think, as John said in the beginning, one of the key goals of APM was to get away from, from the visit being the source of payment, being the only source of payment so that you were paid based on the volume of visits, not necessarily the care you're providing for patients. And I think, um, many of the leaders talked about how the physicians were really the ones to drive this home in the beginning. They were trying to provide patient-centered care and to implement the patient-centered medical home model, but it was really tough to do on top of all of the visits that they had to turn out every day. Um, and I, 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 this quote, I think, illustrates that in talking about the sort of the ball and, the chain, ball and chain on my leg that represents the clinic visit and the value of my work is predic predic predicated upon this quote-unquote visit and that everything else is, is sort of construed as volunteer work. So if I call someone who's struggling at 8 p.m. and talk them out of suicide, that's essentially volunteer work, right? So the idea around shifting to 8 p.m. is to try to find ways to acknowledge that they're caring for a population of patients. And this might not always happen within the confines of a face-to-face -face visit in the office with a physician. Another key impact, or another key sort of imperative of this is trying to help incentivize teamwork. So I really love this quote, and this actually came from Craig Hostetler, who was then the executive director of OPCA. Um, and he used this sports analogy, and this is actually in the, in, the, in the health affairs blog post, if you read it, but he says, imagine if you only paid professional soccer players when they scored goals and expected teamwork to develop. Defense and passing would probably decline. It's the same when you only pay primary care clinics when they produce a short visit with a billable provider. Workflow in the clinic focuses on producing billable visits and becomes a barrier to utilizing the team effectively to produce better health outcomes for all. So I, I think this really illustrates another key goal and hope in terms of changes that are happening in the clinic with APM, that by removing that barrier, by removing the billable 
visit as their form of payment um, and instead paying for the paying for the care of a patient population. The hope was that it could really inspire inspire greater team-based care, um, utilization of other members of the team to provide care to patients that they needed when they needed it. So in that first phase, I'm just gonna give you a quick high level overview of some of the things we found. Um, I had the citation to a paper earlier if you wanted to go get the deeper dive that was on an earlier slide um, that you could take a look at. But I think that what we found in these early phases is that um, there were a couple of buckets of changes that people, that APM was, was causing some of the care teams to make right away. And I will also say that I wanna make, whoops, I wanna make sure people know that this was not uniform. Um, we did see a lot of variation in terms of how quickly people were implementing these changes, but these are some of the types of things that overall we saw happening. Um, I think first, um, so, you know, as we said, the, 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 the sort of square on the left talks about what's happening from the payment, right? PPS is converted. We're not going into these details in this, in this presentation, by the way, because it's pretty, it can be kind of complicated. But in essence, their current visit based, their, their previous visit based rate was transitioned into a per member per month rate um, so that their payment was no longer linked to the volume of visits. Rather, it was linked to the, to the population they were taking care of. And they did have to report back to the state um, on cost quality and access data. And again, the goal was that at least be that it that it at least be equal to what it was before. So as a result of this, here's some of the things we saw in the early practice changes we saw um, happening in the clinics. And again, this was just the first phase of clinics um, that, that kicked off in, in, in 2013. Once, first of all, we saw, we did see some, some evidence of people starting to do, to move more towards team-based care and to try to integrate their teams more closely. Um, some clinics even shifted their workspace such that teams were all co-located together in a pod. Um, many started to think about other roles that they might need on their team that hadn't previously been there. Um, there was some uh, one clinic that, that developed a population health specialist role that could really think about some of the, the non-medical factors that were impacting their population health, really focus on social determinants of health. Um, there was there were clinical pharmacists brought into some, to some clinics. Um, I think the bottom two points were especially pertinent that really helping people be able to work to the top of their license and really expanding the roles that say MAs or um, some of the, the, the non-NP nursing staff would be, would be playing in the care of patients. Um, there was always an example of uh, for diabetics, if maybe when the diabetics come in and, that, and some of the, maybe they just need some, some foot care and that, that could be, that didn't need to be with a, um, physician or advanced practice provider, there could be a nurse or an MA could, that could do some of that work. Um, and then over to the right-hand side, I think the other things we started to see is different ways of engaging patients. Some of the clinics changed their visit length, they made it longer. Um, they also tried to build in some time each day for huddling and with the team and for patient management and for seeing patients in an alternative way. If you're increasing the visit length, that means there may be fewer patients slots in a day, but there are other ways that you could engage with patients, either through group visits, telephone appointments, um, on the patient portal, things that didn't need to, to happen via a visit. And then they also tried to create some more time for panel and population management. So essentially, these are some of the ways that we were seeing changes in payment um, translate into changes the way that care was organized and patients were engaged. Slide. Um, there were some challenges. Um, I think, as everyone who does DNI research, dissemination and implementation research knows, when you're trying to, to have a practice change, that really changing payment doesn't automatically translate into changes in care. There was really a need for leadership and vision, um, need for training and education about this new model. When we were in some of these early clinics, oftentimes many of this, the staff didn't even know what this was, hadn't even heard of it. Um, and, 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 and we also saw that, you know, there were differences between clinics and even differences within clinics among different teams within that clinic in terms of how aware they were of sort of what was going on and their ability to make changes. And I would say the biggest challenge we heard is that there were these new reporting requirements. So no longer was payment based on the volume of visits. 
But it wasn't like the state was saying, just go out and do whatever you want to do and we're going to trust you. They still wanted to see some evidence of that they were providing care and documenting access to care during this time. So, so clinics had to go through a pretty complicated process of patient attribution to make sure that it was clear which patients were theirs, because that would drive their uh, per member per month rate that they get it, that they got, or not get it, that's such a, um, that they got. And they were also required to document something called care steps, which I'm gonna talk about in a moment. These were the non, previously non-billable, non-traditional services, non-visit-based services that were happening um, in their clinics. This was a big learning curve for people. Um, this kind of segues in, I'm going to say a, a little bit and then pass it over to John, but this segues into our, the funding that, that was received from ARC to do some more, to do some quantitative exploration using EHR data of the pre-post changes um, with APM clinics and match controls. And this is looking through phases one through three. So again, phase one clinic started in March 2013. Phase three clinic started in July 2015. So it's extending that time frame a bit. You can see there's a um, protocol paper if you ever wanted to take a look at it um, uh, that can kind of give you a fuller explanation of that. But based on one of some of the qualities qualitative findings, um, especially around trying to document these new ways of providing care and how challenging it was. One of the things I was really interested in is taking a look at how this was happening um, over the first three phases of, of APCM implementation. So this is just a quick snapshot of how the types of ways they were able or were asked to document care. And this was a list of other activities that clinics may have been doing in place of these face-to-face -face visits. Um, Oregon Primary Care Association and Oregon Health Authority really, and the clinics really came together to set up this list of 18 visit and non-visit based services. And many, Ocean was very involved in this too, because in, in, you know, prior to this, some of these were, were in the EHR, but many were not. And so Ocean really played a key role in helping to develop ways to document these in the electronic health record. Um, and these fell into generally four broad categories, sort of new visit types. Some of the things I was mentioning before, like online portal engagement, um, um, group visits, health and wellness calls. Um, the other things were coordination and integration, coordinating care, warm handoffs, behavioral health integration, behavioral health screenings. Those two things on the left were things that um, may have been happening before in the clinics, but, but, but wouldn't necessarily be counting in this way. And then on the right, I think these are some of the newer activities that people were encouraged to really focus on. Um, and, and, and those would fall into the categories of education, wellness, and health promotion. And, and the bottom one, reducing barriers to health. Um, there was a ton of focus on this reducing barriers to health in some of the quarterly learning collaboratives, really thinking through how do we screen our patients for social determinants of health? How do we help our patients reduce barriers um, to uh, accessing their care? How do we help them access community resources, um, transportation assistance, really, really around a lot of the questions we have around striving for health equity. Um, so I think that this, a lot of the focus in getting clinics to learn and do different types of activities was in this, in this bottom right quadrant. So really briefly, and then I'll hand it over to John, I just wanted to give you an overall sense of what was happening with some of these care steps um, over the first three phases. And these are just descriptive. These are purely, we're just reporting sort of rates over time. Um, first, we looked at what was happening with the traditional face-to-face -face visits with physicians or advanced practice providers. And again, previously, this is how clinics would be paid. They wanted to have a lot more of these to get paid more. And what was interesting is you could see a clear decline over the three phases, and that, that was expected. Um, there were even in their, in, their, in their agreements about how, when clinics decided to take part in this, they would work with the state and the state said, we expect this to happen. We expect that there will be a decline in the traditional face-to-face -face visits. But they also wanted to see that there was an increase in these other non-visit based services. Um, so you can see here, um, this, is, this is those non-visit based services and the documentation of these over the three phases. Um, 
And you can see, I think this, this takes, there is a general increase, um, um, but if you look and you see all the different points along that line, you see how much variation there is. So if you're reporting to the state, you may be able to be like, oh yeah, there was this increase in documentation. But I think what this data shows is there's a lot of variation between clinics and how much they're documenting these, these care steps. Um, as we heard in the qualitative portion, this is a tough thing to try to figure out how to do. It's new tools, it's new workflows, it's new staff. And so we just saw a lot, a lot of variability going on in terms of care step documentation. So yes, there was a slight increase, but it's still, um, it, it's still sort of an emerging practice. The other thing about this is we're only able to see what they document. We don't necessarily know what are the activities they're implementing, but this shows at least what they're documenting. One thing where we did see some, some pretty interesting change, as you recall, I talked about the, the team-based care and this, this hope that we can engage other non-physicians, you know, the ancillary staff, um, the MAs, the, the RNs in providing more care. Um, more non-visit, more of that, that, that care that patients might need. And so what this um, graph shows you is, is the rates of that care step document, documentation by physicians and advanced practice providers. And what we're seeing is there is, there is a, you know, a slight trend downwards in that, which again is, would be, it, it, I think would be seen as, a, as sort of expected that it, and, and this is especially happening in phases two and three. Um, and the, the assumption here is that other ancillary staff are being engaged more in, in providing and documenting these other non-traditional types of care. Um, so the idea here is that perhaps, yes, this is working and helping other, other parts of the care team be more engaged. Um, now I'm gonna pass it over to John, who's gonna go um, a little bit further into the quantitative findings. Thanks, Erica. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna, talk for a few minutes just about, about the, the quantitative findings, specifically specifically quantitative findings around the EHR-based analysis. So pulling data from the OCHIN EHR on these clinics. Um, uh, specifically compared to, as you would uh, remember from Eric's, uh, Erica's uh, original description, you know, these analyses are a, a comparison of the APCM clinics to those who weren't, to, to kind of uh, comparison clinics who weren't in APCM. Um, but where Ocean Clinics had had some similarities, but um, the Ocean, at least in the first phase, it's, it's really important to remember that that clinics volunteered for this, and so this was not randomized. Um, this was not, and and I will, um, and, and so there might be some, there probably were some some differences in those clinics, and I think you'll you'll see that kind of as we go through some of this data. Um, and the other thing that I would point out before we go launch into some of these questions is that um, from the study team's perspective, there was not a presumption that, that oh, we're going to capture what's happening with the, definitely with these, with these kind of EHR-based based, uh, investigations. We, I think we had a pretty high degree of humility that this is a complex change um, in a complex uh, time and environment situation. Um, um, and capturing really what is going on is a complex thing. And it, um, but we were going to try to, to ask some questions about what things that might be different um, and see what kind of information we can gather to kind of inform that big picture, gather some pieces um, that might make, uh, might make it a little bit clearer what the possible impacts are, what, 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 what would be fruitful for future study, uh, et cetera. So the first question we asked, well, were there overall changes in number of encounters? So um, the, the kinds of encounters that community health centers use do every day, um, uh, um, we didn't necessarily hypothesize that they'd be different because access was supposed to um, be the same, um, um, but we, we weren't entirely sure what would happen. Um, and so if you could, next slide, please. So what we did was we compared a lot of different um, types of encounters and, 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 and um, analyze what happened to them over time between the two groups of clinics. These are funny looking graphs. Um, there's a bunch of them, this slide and the next. But essentially that dark line is the APCM clinics, that dotted, the dotted line is the fee for, clinics still on fee-for-service. And what we're looking for over time, over this change, that vertical line is the start of the APCM. 
Um, is there a change in a slope of one of those lines with respect to the other? Specifically, was there a change in the APCM line with respect to the slope of the comparator clinics? And while it's a little bit hard to tell here, um, the bottom line is there was no change. There was no significant change in the slope of, a, of one of those lines with the trajectory uh, um, in relation to the other. And we looked at different kinds of visits you know, just to see what, what possibly could change. So, so primary care visits, every, you know, visits that were, were solidly in the primary care kind of uh, uh, coded or classified as a primary care, new patient visits, established patient visits, um, preventive service visits, specifically, you know, ones that visits that were coded as a well child check or a, a, a preventive medicine, Medicare <coughs> wellness visit. Um, excuse me, not my, um, yeah, maybe um, any kind of well person visit. Uh, next slide. Um, limited service visits, which is basically um, visits without full kind of, I think, Ian, uh, evaluation and management codes, mental behavioral health, OB visits, telephone visits, and all of these, um, even though the, 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 the curves look funny and they're a little bit different, obviously the clinics are doing, um, have different characteristics and different features and some differences in their operations. The slopes of these lines, the, the trajectory after APCM, those APCM clinics did not differ um, uh, in relation to um, the, um, the comparators. Um, so pre trends before continued after there wasn't a change. Um, uh, go, uh, next slide, please. So we also asked, well, did this change make a difference in not necessarily encounters, things that actually happen to the clinic, but it's, um, but scheduling. So especially um, if we're thinking about access, did you know, what about wait times to get an appointment? What about same day availability? What, what about, uh, you know, clinics, did it, did it alleviate oh, the need to overbook patients, you know, or, or, or late shows or um, no shows or late cancellations? Were those, those kinds of things that make up such a big part of the daily operations, were those impacted? Uh, next slide. And in one way they, it, they were. Now this is, um, similarly, this is one of those run charts that shows over time before and after. Now, in this analysis, and I'll kind of walk you through this figure real quick, a couple, um, a couple things uh, are notable. We, in this analysis, we felt compelled also to consider, uh, um, we could really had to the Affordable Care Act. So the, the APCM started on in early spring of 2013. Nine months later, 2014, January 1st, the Affordable Care Act kicked in. And, and as many of you know, um, who work at community health centers, there was a large influx of patients, which obviously affects this. And so we felt compelled to describe that these trends over that, uh, or note when that change happened. Um, and the, the, same, um, the same principle, looking at these lines, is, is where our kind of analysis led us. Is, is there a change, statistically, is there a change in, in the relation of that APCM line to the non? Um, what turns out is when b between that pre APM that that block all the way in the left and that cent in the center one, which is that post the AP um, APCM change before the Affordable Care Act kicked in, it actually turned out that there was a change. That um, um, APCM clinics had twenty percent more uh, same day availability, um, and that's measured specifically just to um, it's basically the number the number of appointment search or uh, scheduling searches. That would reveal us that would reveal a same day visit of uh, available 20 percent higher and it was statistically significant um obviously the 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 uh, disappointment here is that we had this other major change and and couldn't follow that out for further to see if that kind of trend persisted um um because you know clinics had a massive influx of patients um, but for this period that was actually a, a um, was a significant change. Next slide, please. However, there was no difference you know, in some other metrics in that, in that specific analysis. So wait time, which is basically the, you know, the time to the third next available visit, which is a common metric in uh, uh, using primary care. Um, number of overbooks, um, basically, basically the number of times that, uh, two different patients are booked in the same slot. Um, no shows and late cancellations, which are kind of similar. Um, those were not, did not, not differ over the time period between APCM clinics and non-APCM clinics. Next slide. But in this, um, if we're thinking about um, obviously access and quality, one of the questions comes up is, um, 
uh, can we, uh, or were there differences in, in the in pro common preventive services that were offered or, or offered or delivered um, over, the, over this period of time? Um, next slide, please. Um, and it, there was one we saw, um, and I'll, um, what we, um, what we looked at was whether the rates of those services, um, uh, per given number of patients who would qualify for that service on sex and age criteria, um, did those, did those change over time in, in relation to the non-APCM clinics? We did not always look at, um, um, you know, that sometimes when we, we look at preventive services in our research, um, uh, you have to get into, you know, was this was a given person or persons indicated for at that point in time. This didn't look at, at, at a lot of those details, but just looked at whether the rates of services um, um, changed. Um, they largely didn't. Um, th what you see here is that that vertical line is that AP, the comparison to APC chem clinics. Um, we looked at two different phases here, as, as uh, Dr. Cottrell said, er, there's um, uh, multiple phases and we wanted to look at, look at different phases. Um, the one notable thing is that in that in the first phase, APCM clinics did have a greater um, uh, rate of mammography order, ordering than the um, comparison clinics. Unfortunately, I think in phase three and a couple of the other phases, that um, uh, there was a problem with the data. I think, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm forgetting exactly what it was to make it that analysis not not um, useful, um, but in other phases two and four and five, there were no differences. Um, and so that we had that one finding um, of, a, of, of increased mammography rates. Next slide. Another interesting piece of this, of that, this specific analysis is, and this is done by Maria Ukanda, one of our postdoc fellows, is, um, is looking, asking, well, if, if these, if the, if the, Preventive services aren't changing, or if, you, if they were, but if uh, but what's what um, what types of encounters are you being used to complete order whatever these services? Um, and there was not a significant difference, but um, in between um, in the kind of the trajectory. But there's some interesting things, and this this figure it's a little and it's a little not quite intuitive at first, but um, just take the left one. In phase one implementation, in phase one, phase one clinics, so the first phase, um, and take the, um, the orange is the APCM, the blue is the comparison clinics, and take the, the a fine dotted line. It's so when orange, it goes from 33% before to 40%, and then in the blue, it's 17 to 21. What that indicates is before the APCM, um, uh, the proportion of total encounters that a clinic used were um, my chart or telephone encounters. That went up to 40%. Uh, it went up in the phase one, or excuse me, in the, in the non-APCM from 17 to 21 as well. Um, and so there was, not a, there was not a change in the trajectory, but you, you see two things here. You see that the clinics are very different in their use of those encounters. So that's, that's, that's a pretty big gulf, 33 to 17. And there's an overall trend in an, in an in, increase um, uh, of u utilization of those types of encounters. Um, uh, and that's the context in which all those preventive services are delivered. Um, I think that's a, it's, it's worth, even though it may not have been an experimental difference, it's worth to it observe that overall trend of these increased use of non-traditional encounters. We kind of saw that in some of the touches that it, Eric talked about uh, as well. The next slide. And finally, we did ask, what about cost? Now, cost is really always tricky to measure um, because the, you know, the question is, what well, cost to who and exactly what? But um, next slide. But what we did look at was Medicaid expenditures. And essentially, what the state did is, is over the course, even though the, the payments to, to clinics changed, there was still what we called shadow billing. Basically, when people didn't come in for a visit or when a service was ordered, there was kind of this um, false, not false, but shadow billing to, to see what still what services were being provided um, to make sure that the whole thing was kind of overall or, or, or uh, to get, get a sense of some budget neutrality, to get a sense of what was being done. Um, but our question was, well, what is the, was there any change in the volume of or the price weighted volume of those, of those primary care services. So services, there were common things, evaluation and management codes for visits, tests like labs, 
um, imaging, proceed, common procedures in primary care and durable medical equipment. Um, that they were all controlled for the for the current Medicaid price, um, and then expressed as a member per member per month, you know, uh, cost or price. This did not get at what Medicaid would have actually paid for it. It did not. It certainly did not get it at uh, or aim to describe the cost to clinics of providing these services. It was just the pricing, the Medicaid pricing on the services that were provided at the time. Uh, next slide. And what we saw was that, um, and it, you know, this is a time. Um, a, a time graph figure as well. And you see that price weighted volume actually is starting to drop, but then at that inflection point, at just, just you know, in the <clears throat> right around that zero time, I think it's just shifted a little bit. Um, those price, that price, the prices or the price of those services or the, um, the total of those services really does drop. So that essentially clinics are, were, um, uh, not performing or, or um, um, as much, not, um, they were not, there, there was a cost difference. There was not a cost, but expenditure, there was a difference associated with this, um, with this change. Next slide. And specifically what the analysis revealed is that it was um, almost entirely due to a reduction in the order of ordering of imaging. In the community health services, in community health centers, and since we had Medicaid claims, it was not that those, you know, X-rays and ultrasounds were ordered in other places. Um, it was that um, it just as they weren't done. Um, and those of you who are familiar with, you know, uh, efforts to you know reduce unnecessary care and so forth, um, sometimes imaging is one of those targets. And so it's it's pro it's um, it is thought provoking to think that this payment change might have resulted in some trimming down of certain services that, that sometimes in some situations can be uh, unnecessary. That's a little bit of speculation, but, but it, it's a, it's a, it's thought provoking. Um, next slide. And I think, and, and, and we're gonna sum up and I think Erica's back to you for. Yeah, yeah. So I think as we look through the body of these quantitative results, we wanna ask, you know, was APCM associated with changes in access, quality, or costs. And I think, as John uh, articulated, I think, you know, maybe, often not. Um, it's it's kind of hard to see a clear, there's little bits of, of change. And I think what was interesting is we continued to work with the Oregon Primary Care Association and, and other stakeholders to kind of look at these findings we had and help interpret them. And I, mean, I think one thing that kept coming out is like part of the goal of this pilot was to ensure that this change of in payment change in payment wouldn't negatively impact access quality or costs. It'd be great if it got better, but they just mainly at first wanted to show it wouldn't get worse. And so, in many ways, like showing little bits of change or even null findings in this in this kind of a study are actually really important and, and impactful. So I think that was that was something interesting that we continued to discuss throughout as we as we. Um, saw what we were coming up with and as we presented these in our publications. And I'm gonna, we're kind of going back and forth for a couple of these, John, over to you, whoops. Yeah. And, and right, just to, I mean, um, it, it was interesting. And you know, there were some small, but potentially significant changes, you know, same day appointment availability, That's, that can be a, a, right, a big deal if it, if it, if it lasts um, and is persistent. Um, um, reduction in unnecessary imaging, if that's, if that's what we were indeed seeing, uh, um, qualify that. Um, but, you know, time will tell if these trends persist. And then there was that, just that larger trend that we observed that non-visit-based services were increasing. Um, maybe related to APCM, maybe not. Uh, um, but that was a, but, but definitely an observ observed trend in, in, in many clinics throughout the study period. Next slide. But there's obviously, you know, this is not, would not be a surprise to many of you. Like there's a lot of limitations here, right? Um, and specifically in the situation, the, the EHR data, not capture, I mean, capturing pieces, but not capturing everything, not, certainly not capturing the experience of clinicians, clinics and staff. Um, selection bias, obviously that first phase, especially was volunteer. So you, you, you were, we were sometimes measuring apples and oranges, very, very um, um, clinics that were operating very differently. Um, finding suitable comparisons was difficult, um, or, will, or is, is continually and increasingly difficult. And and this one, you know, difficult to isolate the impact of the APCM from other policy changes. As you, many of you know who work in community health centers, 
there's 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 always so many things going on. There's so many initiatives. There's so many um, um, things that affect the clinical op clinic operations. And isolating that out is almost impossible. Um, and one could argue sometimes it may not even, it may not even be the priority, right? Maybe you just need we need to know the overall trends that are multifactorial. But it is difficult when you're trying to figure out if one specific policy worked or not. And, and obviously, additional you know additional interviews as, as times went on would have been really helpful. Um, but those are um, just they're they're time and labor intensive, not just for the research team, but obviously for the for the clinics to to, to support those activities. So I'm going to talk about kind of I think some of the some of the lessons learned throughout the this body of work and. Um, I think as I, we started talking out talking about in the qualitative findings that you know payment change doesn't immediately translate into practice change. Um, you know, in some of the earlier earlier uh, qualitative work we did, um, in some clinics they they didn't really even understand that there was a payment change or <laughs> among some members of clinics. And I really think that we did start to see early evidence of change, but I think it's going to really take a longer time frame and additional ways of measuring impact. Just, just by way of sharing as well, I think that even some of the early leaders and pioneers of developing this, this approach, um, some of the folks at Oregon Primary Care Association did even share, they were, they were sort of surprised sometimes that there wasn't more change right off the bat. Um, and that it does take a while for people to kind of have that culture shift and, and the need for leadership. So um, I think that was one of the, the, the key things that, that came about. I also think this is something we talk a lot about, but policy and research timelines are quite different. Um, we, I think there was a, a hope that, that they needed these findings quickly. You can't always get those findings quickly. And also it's just, it takes time to get the studies funded. Um, so we would be really excited that we finally got a study funded like three, four years later and, and uh, others you know, were like, well, wait, we've moved on from this. We, we needed those answers like two years ago. So I think that that's, that's always, it's a constant tension. tension. Um, one of the thing I noted that was really interesting, especially the way we did this initial qualitative research, is that we spent time in the clinics. We spent time in these learning collaboratives that the clinics were attending. We really got to know the folks at OPCA who were spearheading this. Um, you start to, I think that it, it was an excellent way to be embedded, but you do start to want it to succeed. And so you, you kind of see why they try to separate policy and research. Um, and, and so that the research can be truly objective. So I think that there was some challenge in walking that line there. And even as we were um, conveying findings, you know, there, there would be, you, you don't want to put out something that might be damaging to the initiative. And on the other hand, maybe that is the position. It, it, it's, a, it's a tough, it's a tough balance to make, I think, because, um, and, and sort of shows why often these two endeavors are, are a bit more separate. And then finally, as John kind of touched on, I really do think that to fully evaluate these complex policy decisions, we need more mixed methods evaluation over longer periods and, and really that qualitative work. I think coming back to sort of what, what I talked about early on and that um, what we heard is for met sort of providers were some of the ones who were feeling the pinch of trying to implement this patient-centered medical home model, and that there was this recognition that the payment system wasn't aligning with this way of providing care and there needed to be a change. And that it was this burden of providers that, that, that we at least heard this, that a burden on providers was really driving this. And so I think it would be really fascinating to come back now a few years later, now it's like seven years later, and really talk to some of the providers and say like, how's this going? Has this changed how you feel? Has this changed how you're feeling in terms of your workload or your ability to care for patients differently? And to also talk to other, other members of the care team to see if it has changed their ability to contribute meaningfully to patient care. And then finally, to talk to patients. Um, I think people mentioned they weren't sure how their patients were, gonna, were going to react to this. And sometimes patients want to see their doctor. They don't want to see the MA or they don't want to talk on the phone. They want to see their doctor in the office. So, so I think talking to patients to see how it's, how, it's, how it's been for them would be another interesting thing to do um, in the future and, and where we need more information. And John, did you want to have a sum up statement and in addition to sort of recognizing sure so this is the, the, we're not we won't read everybody but we had a, um just for time's sake but we had an amazing uh study team across multiple organizations 
and are indebted to everybody's hard work. Um, and we'll really go, you can just hit the next slide, Erica. Um, the thank you for listening. Um, we're happy to take some questions and, you know, especially I mean, maybe people on the, on the um, call who participated in APCM or in AP, APCM clinic, love to hear your experiences or other thoughts about how to go about understanding some of these policy changes. Um, love to hear comments uh, or questions on that because um, this was this was a very interesting learning experience for all of us. So I'll stop talking and open the floor. All right, thank you, John and Erica. Uh, so we have our first question, and just so everyone knows, we are getting close to time. But I thought this question is a really fantastic question. I wanted to get it out there. It comes from Julie Stone, who says, "Based on your findings, can you identify things you think the clinics could have done more of?" to demonstrate bigger impacts on these three key outcomes. And if I can just take an initial crack at that, Julie, I think that's um, a really good question. And I think as part of what, with that sort of maybe slide we presented, we were trying to get at a little bit in that. Um, I think for many, they would see not having huge differences in outcomes as actually a success, that they were able to change this payment and it didn't negatively impact access quality or, or outcomes. And that was really the, the goal of the initial phase. Let's show we can do this. We can shift the way that we're paying and it's not going to be detrimental. So I think that's my, my first response is that these null, like in places where we do have null or minimal findings, that could be a positive, actually construed as a positive or a success. And I don't know if you want to add anything, John. Yeah, I guess I'd say well, certainly, I think as far as from the clinic perspective, how the question was asked, like I, there's not only anything the clinics could have done. I think the clinics were trying to really adjust to a change in um, uh, a pretty complex environment. You know, I think the question we always ask is, could, the, could we as the researchers have done anything different to understand better? And, and, and we kind of got at that at that, you know, having more resources to, to understand the experience of people on the ground over the long haul would, would be something that I'd, I'd like to have been able to do um, a little more. But it's a great question, Julie. All right, we have a question. Oh, sorry, John. Go ahead, Will, go ahead. Uh, we have a question from Caleb Sanford who asks, uh, what the data continued to be collected since these findings? Has the data improved over the last five years? Or sorry, was the data continued? Um, so the, the data, the EHR data that we collected has not been continued to be, or it has not, we're not still collecting um, that. Um, so some of those, in, in, you know, our data is a little bit different. Some of them just, just showed the first phases for that preventive services slide that I showed. We actually had five, we had five or six of those phases so that went longer, but there was, I showed kind of a representative sample and it was not different. So there's no indication that there was any kind of change. I don't know about care steps. Did that keep going, Erica? I can't remember. Oh yeah, I mean that they're having. So that's what I think. That's one thing that's interesting is that I do think these care steps, which they're required to document, I think we can expect that the quality of that is going to keep increasing over time. Um, right at first, there was they they shifted the incentives for capturing that. I think at first they had to I wrote it down somewhere. They had to make sure that seventy five percent of their their patients had care steps. Um, documented and later on, how did they shift it? Yeah, initially they had to have a at least one meaningful care step within the past month for 70 to 75 percent of patients. As of 2017, they shift the OHA shifted this and they said they would remove patients from their sort of list of patient from their panels if they didn't have a visit or a care step in an eight quarter look back period. So that meaning meaning they wouldn't get payment for those patients. So I think having more of like a firm requirement will have the effect of my, my hypothesis would be it would it will increase the um, the way that 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 clinics are, are documenting those care steps it'll work it'll it'll ensure that that's being documented more accurately and readily is would be my hypothesis and that's something that if we had future funding we could certainly look at All right, thank you Erica and John we are we only have about a minute or two left, but I wanted to get this final question out from Jeffrey Thomas, who asks, how do you mix the patients with the ones that have insurance plans that participate in APCM and FFF, FFS? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think, um, so we so we did it a couple of ways. We had this discussion frequently. It's a great question. Because the question is, I mean, it, uh, um, we often, we often just 
here's a, our, our approach was generally this, Jeff. We, we, would, we would look at the entire patient population, and then what we would do is we would look at a sub-segment of just Medicaid people to see if it was any different, just to make just kind of check ourselves. The reason we started with the whole population was, A, number one, th that Medicaid patients were a, um, a high proportion of, uh, of folks in the clinic anyway. And clinics had to make global changes. They couldn't just make changes for a, a Oregon Medica a Medicaid patient. So we, we, we looked at the whole thing because the changes clinic were, were clinic-wide. Uh, and then we would look at a subset of, of folks who were, who were just Oregon Medicaid, who were, so, who were really the direct targets of the payment and, and looked at, did the, did, the, did the trends differ in just this group of people in whatever outcome? And when we did that, it was, all, it was basically always the same. Um, it wasn't like this difference in outcomes between the Medicaid people and the, and the whole clinic population. So I think that, 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 if that makes sense, that was our approach. All right. Thank you, John. And thank you, Erica, for that fantastic presentation. And thank you to everyone who attended today's session. Be sure to follow OHSU Family Medicine on Twitter at, at OHSU Family Med and follow Ochin on Twitter at, at Ochin Inc. and over on LinkedIn. In addition, be sure to head over to ochin.org and advancedcollaborative.org to read the latest on our research studies, blog posts, and upcoming events. And be sure to stay tuned for next month's Ochin Grand Rounds as we welcome Dr. Benjamin Sanders and Erica Turley from Seattle King County as they present on Seattle King County's Jail to Community Health Center Buprenorphine Program. So from all of us at Ochin and from Dr. Heinzman and Dr. Cottrell, to all of you out there, have a great weekend and stay healthy out there. Thanks, Will. Thanks, thanks Will. Everyone. Yep, thanks, everybody. Great. Thanks for the questions, too.